thanks, Ian, um, for your kind comments. Um, to Sarah, uh, Lisa, and her team at Creative Cardiff for inviting me to speak at this timely conference. And it's timely not just for the city of Cardiff, of course, uh, because there's renewed interest across the country in the potential of industrial strategy and how the creative economy should feature in it. So I'm going to use the time I've got available. Uh, I'm just going to click the next slide. I'm going to use the time I have available to explain the powerful role that rigorous classification and measurement can play in industrial development through legitimizing new and emerging parts of the economy. Now, I want to illustrate that measurement of the creative economy has enabled in terms of allowing us to more accurately characterize the nature of the creative economy and to alert policymakers to its economic significance. In short, its role in putting creativity on the map. But I also want to illustrate how the recent expansion in data sets available to analysts and a widening of analytical toolkits has permitted a richer understanding of the creative economy. And I'll end by suggesting that it is now time to push forward the measurement agenda in the creative economy area beyond legitimation and towards a more active role for data in creative economy development. So let me begin by showing you some incredible statistics. This chart is what an analyst of the UK's creative industries may have plotted in December 2011. It shows the gross value added of the UK's creative industries on the primary axis, that's the orange line, and expressed as a percentage of whole economy gross value added, GVA, on the secondary axis, which is the blue line. The chart shows that the creative industries were growing until 2007-8, at which point they appear to have undergone a cataclysmic reduction in output. In actual fact, there had been no such industrial collapse. Rather, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport had in December 2011 reclassified the list of industrial sectors deemed creative for measurement purposes, and in particular excluded two ICT-related standard industrial classification codes, SIT codes, I'll say a bit more about these, which had previously been included in the statistics. And they recomputed the series for 2008 onwards on that basis. The episode, episode caused huge controversy and confusion in the industry. They revealed that the basis on which the government labelled some industries as creative and, other, and others as not was unclear. And notwithstanding the obvious point that breaks in the series preclude time series analysis, they showed that government misunderstood how much industry cares about official statistics. The series was suspended in 2012. So for a number of years, researchers in Europe and in Australia had been using household census and labour force survey data to measure employment in the creative industries and employment in creative occupations. A common feature of these studies was the top-down nature of the, their selection of SIC codes, these industry codes I mentioned, and standard occupational classification codes, SOC codes. These are the international standard by which occupations are classified by governments. This left these studies, top-down studies, open to the criticism that they were not using a coherent group of SIC and SOC codes. The contribution of the dynamic mapping, which I show here, which we published with Alan Freeman and Peter Higgs at the Queensland U University of Technology in Brisbane in 2013, was that an industry's creative intensity, and that's the percentage of an in industry's workforce that's employed in creative roles, could be used to identify creative from non-creative industries. The approach is made up of three steps. In the first, we develop rules to label some occupational codes, SOC codes, as creative. In the second step, we use labor force survey data to label as creative industries as those industry codes, SIC codes, with unusually high creative intensity, adopting a creative thre uh, intensity threshold above which all industries are labeled as creative. And in the third step, we use these labels and the labor force survey data to estimate employment in the creative industries, as well as what uh, uh, Ian described earlier as the creative economy, which we define as employment in the creative industries, plus, importantly, creative workers employed in non-creative industries. So as a systematic methodology for classifying and measuring the size of the creative industries, the dynamic mapping has a number of features which has made it attractive to UK policymakers. First, it makes transparent the basis on which some occupations and industries are deemed creative and others are not, which enables the statistics to be challenged and adapted. 
Secondly, it enables creative industry statistics to be constructed using official codes, these SIC codes and SAC codes I've been referring to, and make use of data sources which are official, which makes them strictly comparable over time and with other sectors. Third, it has enabled the UK to be the first country in the world to publish official creative economy statistics alongside its creative industries estimates. Typically in international discussions, you'll see the words creative industries and economy used interchangeably, and it's that fuzziness in language and terminology that we and, uh, uh, and other researchers uh, have argued has contributed to, to the lack of credibility of the sector in the eyes of economic policymakers. And fourth, uh, last not le but not least, it's a dynamic method in that an industry's creative intensity can change over time, meaning that in principle, industries can become more or less creative. And so for all of these reasons, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, the DCMS, adopted the method in January 2014 following a public consultation. So if you just uh, uh, give me a bit of time to delve into the methodology in just a little more detail. The slide sets out one approach for identifying creative occupations, which is you'll call the first step in this three-step procedure. So in our conceptualization, creative occupations are those, uh, those roles that bring cognitive skills to bear to bring about differentiation to yield either novel or significantly enhanced products whose final form is not fully specified in advance. Now that's a bit of a mouthful. To operationalize this definition, we suggested a set of five intuitive criteria based on our reading of the various literatures on creative work and subjectively scored all codes at the four-digit level in the UK standard occupational classification, the SOC, against these criteria. We used the rule that an occupation had to score at least four out of five against these criteria to earn the label creative. Now, this is an inherently subjective exercise, so we spent a good deal of time testing the overall sensitivity of the results to this threshold and to the exclusion of more contested occupations and the results of the sensitivity testing are presented in very great detail in the Nesta report. Note that the DCMS's departmental focus, which does not include scientific creativity, has implications for how these criteria are implemented. In that occupations like natural and social scientists are not scored as creative when arguably they do share many common traits with creative jobs. And consistent with this, when we adopt an alternative algorithmic approach to labeling creative occupations, which makes use of very detailed skills content data for different jobs in the economy, we indeed identify a broader class of occupations classed as creative. So this chart here uh, is taken from a Nesta paper published last year in collaboration with Carl Benedict Frey and Mike Osborne from the Oxford Martin School at Oxford University. It uses UK labour force survey data from 2013. In, in that study, in the 2013 study, uh, so, sorry, in, in, in the present study I'm mentioning here, we use expert judgment to label a sample of, occupa of, of, of occupations as either creative and not creative, and then use the detailed skills descriptions of occupations from the US Department of Labor's ONET database to train a machine learning classifier, which for all occupations in the U UK workforce, all of these SOC codes, assigns a probability that a role is creative. Using this approach, we estimated that 24% of the UK workforce was in creative roles, treating all occupations with a probability of higher than 0.7 as being creative. You can see this in the chart. And this number, 24%, turns out to be around four times higher than what we find in the dynamic mapping and in the official UK statistics. Reassuringly, the list included nearly all of the occupations labelled as creative in the dynamic mapping, but intuitively included a large number of other occupations, including, I'm pleased to say, economists and social scientists, which many of us would like to think of as involving a high degree of creati creativity, even if the DCMS cannot. So, armed with our narrower list of creative occupations, in the second step of the dynamic mapping, we inspected the distribution of creative employment across industries by their creative intensity. This chart here is taken from the 2013 paper and again uses labour force survey data from 2010. Now, looking at this chart, perhaps the main contribution of the dynamic mapping was to note the bimodality of this distribution. On the one hand, the chart shows that very large amounts of creative workers were employed in industries whose creative intensity was in single digits. Remember, creative intensity is the percentage of your workforce in creative jobs, so defined. So the column on the left-hand side of this chart 
shows that over 300,000 created jobs were found in industries in the UK where less than 5% of the overall workforce was made up of created jobs. But on the other, it shows that large numbers of creative workers were also employed in industries with very high creative intensity. So around 400,000 creative jobs were found in industries with a creative intensity of between 55 and 65%. Over 50,000 were found in industries where between 85 and 95% of jobs were in creative roles. We proposed a simple probabilistic procedure for identifying a threshold creative intensity, which turns out to be 30%. And we use this to partition this distribution into two. We label the industries shaded darker green here the creative industries, and the ones shaded lighter green not creative. Now, these non-creative industries are, in fact, very major employers of creative talent. Turns out as many people are employed in creative roles outside the creative industries as within, hence the importance of the creative economy. But what singles out the creative industries as a coherent group, and this is important, it's a coherent group, it binds these different subsectors making up the creative industries together, is that they each specialise in the employment of creative people. Now, I've spent some time going into some technical detail uh, about how we classify and define creative industries. Uh, and the reason why I've done that is that a huge benefit of having creative economy statistics that are defined using these codes, the industrial and occupational classification standards, is that it allows us to interrogate official data in a way that is strictly consistent with other sectors and occupations, thus increasing the credibility of, of the statistics and therefore the sector in the eyes of policymakers. As internationally set standards, they raise the prospect of internationally comparable creative economy statistics too, something we've explored with Max Nathan at Birmingham University using the European Labour Force Survey data for EU countries and Labour Force Survey data for the US and Canada. Now other countries, Australia, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland to mention a few, are at various stages of applying the method too. And reassuringly, when we look at the industry distributions of creative intensities in those countries for which we have data, we see the familiar bimodal shape here. The creative workforce uh, specialization profile that is the defining feature of the creative industries. Importantly, the use of the standard industrial and occupational classification has also enabled us to test where the standards are lacking and point to ways in which they can be reformed. And we're delighted that we have an opportunity at Nesta to explore further how the occupational and industrial standards can be improved through the work we'll be doing in the ONS's new Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence that Nesta has been selected to create with the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, King's London, Cambridge University and other partners. Now, one phenomenon that's particularly relevant to our discussion here today that has, the has held the interest of industrial policymakers since at least 1990 when Michael Porter popularised po popularized it is the idea of industrial clusters. In the creative economy, these are defined as geographical hotspots of creative businesses that collaborate and compete. Now, previous research, including Nestor's, had shown that these were a central feature of creative industries and the wider creative economy. The positive finding was that these clusters were associated with high rates of innovation and economic growth. But the downside was that they were unevenly spread across the country. In a statistic which uh, uh, Ian mentioned earlier, in 2015, to the geography of the UK's creative and high-tech economies, we showed that London and the southeast of England accounted for 43% of all employment in the creative economy. Because this estimate was constructed on the basis of the new DCMS classifications, the dynamic mapping classifications, making use of standard codes, we could show that it compared with 31% in the high-tech economy and 28% in the UK workforce as a whole. It turns out the creative economy is one of the most, uh, one of the most unequally distributed, geographically distributed parts of the economy. So two big questions were therefore, how do we strengthen creative clusters that already exist, whether they're in the south and southeast of England or, or not, and how do we catalyse new ones that don't? Ian mentioned the manifesto for the creative economy that we worked on together, uh, which was published in 2013 with Juan. And there we proposed this seven-point plan for policymakers and local de development agencies. And just to go into these in a bit more detail, the first point was be data-driven. Policymakers should use data to, to identify areas of existing local strength, including measuring the number, the size, and trajectory of local firms in different creative subsectors, and the types of graduates and the types of research being produced by local universities. 
We noted the value of benchmarking against other places, hence the importance of standards. Policymakers needed also to be mindful of the limitations of official data sources, where, for example, micro-businesses and freelancers were often unrepresented, or where the activities of emerging sectors were misclassified. In these cases, we urge greater use of alternative data sources, just such as what can be scraped from company websites or social networks. Our second point was that policymakers should be pragmatic. They were advised to avoid wishful attempts to build clusters, clusters from scratch, as, as successful examples of the latter are few and far between. All the evidence suggested that a locality's industrial opportunities are heavily constrained by its current strengths and weaknesses. A more productive approach was to build on areas of existing strength. The third point in our plan was that policymakers should listen. They should adopt a similarly data-driven approach to identifying barriers to cluster development and potential remedies. Learning from the experience of stakeholders was critically important, but this required honest and self-critical evaluations of policies and detailed consultation with local businesses. And when doing this, it's important to minimize the risk of capture by local vested interests by listening to all of the voices in the cluster, not just those that are within the risk reach. We argued that policymakers should invest in people as well as buildings. Policymakers had historically conceived of interventions to support clusters in terms of new buildings, such as incubators, cultural quarters, and iconic art centers, rather than investments in creative and entrepreneurial skills. Yet it was creative talent, as I've said earlier, that's the defining asset of the creative economy. Policymakers, we argued, should weigh the opportunity costs of investments in bricks and mortar against the benefits of other interventions, for example, work placements, internships for creative graduates. The outcomes of these investments might be less obviously visible than in the case of capital projects, but they might be more beneficial in the long run. Fifthly, we stressed the importance of leveraging anchor institutions, such as universities, in developing creative clusters. Now, universities played an obvious role in the areas of talent supply and research, but the more entrepreneurial ones were developing alternative ways of supporting the creative economy, such as through convening networks and promoting knowledge exchange. The sixth point in the plan was that policymakers should raise visibility and strengthen networks. A finding of much earlier work on creative clusters was that an unconnected, unself-aware mass of creative businesses would not fully benefit from knowledge spinovers or sharing of local resources. We suggested that policymakers could help remedy the situation by promoting local opportunities to creative talent and by supporting local business networks. And a priority was to develop fit-for-purpose evaluation methodologies that can guide policymakers in making these efforts. And last but not least, we urge policymakers to think systemically. We characterize creative clusters as having their own distinctive innovation systems, comprising local labor markets, research bases, financial systems, physical, digital, and cultural infrastructures, and mechanisms for collaboration and competition. Clusters were also embedded, embedded in an international creative economy. This meant that discrete interventions would rarely be enough to support sustainable growth in a cluster. It was important to pay attention to the whole system. Happily, since writing the manifesto for the creative economy, as more and more data sources have become available to researchers, and as economists we've become more adept at using computational techniques from data science, we've been able to develop our thinking a lot further. This year, in Tech Nation 2016, we have identified and mapped the UK's digital tech clusters in partnership with Tech City UK. And in the geography of creativity in the UK, with Creative England shown here, we have revisited the case of creative clusters. We have sourced data from wherever we have been able to find it, from the Office for National Statistics, from open data sources, and by scraping data from online sources. We have also employed analytical techniques that have been less traditionally used to characterize creative clusters, including machine learning and social network analysis. And we have tried to take seriously the economic complexity of creative clusters, while at the same time attempting to make that complexity analyt analytically tractable through the use of interactive maps and other data visualization. The geography of creativity confirms that the creative industries account for a growing share of economic activity in local economies right across the UK regions and nations. This chart uses data from the ONS's business structure database to show that the creative industries have gained in importance over the 27 to 2014 period in most uh, travel to work areas. Technically, you can think of these as roughly corresponding to metropolitan areas. 
The business numbers here are particularly striking, with more than 9 in 10 of UK travel-to-work areas having grown their creative business numbers as the share of overall businesses. It turns out that creative services subsectors, like design, software and digital advertising, have grown especially rapidly. But the other implication of the high rate of business entrepreneurship that we've seen is that almost all creative subsectors have experienced a reduction in average firm size. In 2007, creative businesses in the UK employed an average of just under four workers. By 2014, just seven years later, that had declined by 15% to 3.3. The report confirms again the high concentration of creative activity in London and the South East of England that we've alluded to earlier. But it shows, if anything, this concentration is getting more pronounced over time. Now, a key research finding is that creative clusters can take very different forms. Our method for identifying clusters is to group creative subsectors together based on their co-location patterns, and then to look for geographic hotspots of group activity. And this is a, a drawing from a, a, um, a methodology developed by Michael Porter and, and Mercedes Delgado in the States. We measure activity by concentration levels, that is the relative importance of the sector in the local economy, but also in terms of how rapidly creative activity has grown over time. And we do this because we want to capture up and coming clusters. This map shows the 47 clusters we identify using the method. It highlights that although creative clusters have a stronger presence in London and the southeast of England, which together account for around one third of the clusters we identify, there are also hotspots of creative activity throughout the UK. The map also suggests that there are several creative agglomerations encompassing more than one of these TTWAs. We see this around Manchester and Leeds, for example, but also Bath, Bristol and Cardiff. Note also the appearance of locations like Slough and Heathrow, High Wycombe and Aylesbury, Peterborough, Guildford and Aldershot. These are far from creative cities as usually defined. These clusters, specialising in a small number of subsectors with large high-tech companies, may be less hip than creative cities like Liverpool, Manchester and Cardiff, with their more subsectorally diversified creative economies, but they make outsized contributions to the creative economy. The message to policymakers is clear. One size does not fit all when it comes to creative clusters. The report also documents the significant levels of university activity, both in terms of relevant education and research, that takes place in the UK's creative clusters. This Coxcomb diagram depicts for 33 of the creative clusters, because we only had space for 33, the levels of talent provision using data on the number of graduates in arts and design and computer science from the Higher Education Statistics Agency, on high quality research measured by the number of full-time equivalent researchers doing world-class research in these disciplines as judged in Hefke's REF, Research Excellence Framework data, and indicators of knowledge exchange based on a number of different survey questions we extract from the Higher Education Statistics Agency's Higher Education Business Community Interaction Survey. The length of the segments represent the level of local activity in each of these indicators relative to other clusters, and it ranges between one and 10. And you're gonna have to have exceptionally good eyesight to pick off Cardiff there, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I'll draw attention to one or two of the results. Um, as I say, the, the length of the segment represents you know, how pronounced a particular activity is in each of these clusters relative to other clusters. One means that the area is in the bottom 10% of all clusters, and 10 meaning that it's in the top 10% of all of these clusters. Now, as we might expect, London at the top left there scores highly on all the variables, but so do other clusters seemingly benefit from strong talent and knowledge ecosystems, including Cardiff. Some of these findings appear to mirror differences in cluster specialisms. Brighton's excellence in arts and design research and its high level of event attendees, which is one measure of knowledge exchange measure, uh, activity, might be linked to the city's cultural scene, for example, while Bristol, the UK's headquarters, for Hewlett-Packard and home to a vibrant tech sector has strengthened her strengths around computer science education and research. Cardiff, with its strong film, television and radio sector and rapidly growing software development sector, has strengths in arts and design and computer science education and performs broadly well on all knowledge exchange activities shown here. Using data from the online events platform meetup.com, we also try and quantify the importance of networking activity in the creative industries. Specifically, we obtained data about active UK meetup groups focused on tech and business networking and used text mining techniques to identify those that specialise in creative topics such as mobile and games, web design and digital marketing. It turns out that there are over 1,200 active meetup groups focusing on these creative topics alone 
with participation of around 170,000 unique individuals. So on this particular measure, there has been an explosion of creative meetup activity paralleling the growth of creative industries. Topics like freelance work, user experience, data analytics have grown especially quickly. Meetup data also permits us to look at how network activity varies across creative clusters. There's a striking contrast here between creative cities like Cambridge, Manchester and Edinburgh on the one hand, and creative conurbations like Reading, High Wycombe and Guildford on the other, with the latter having much lower levels of networking activity relative to the size of their creative workforce. Uh, they also have a narrow range of topics discussed and much lower levels of intersecting networking. No doubt this partly reflects the more specialised and larger firm nature of creative activities in, in these clusters that I mentioned. Nonetheless, the findings raise the question of whether more developed levels of networking will be essential to help sustain the long-term success of those clusters. We look at the topics that different creative clusters specialise in based on the number of meetup groups in a particular topic. Creative cities tend on the whole to have more diversified creative me meetup scenes with activity in a wide range of topics. Cardiff creative meetup activity seems particularly centred on data analytics. The meetup data was also interesting in revealing the hidden connections between the UK's creative clusters. This chart investigates the meetup co-membership patterns of individuals based in different places. The left-hand panel shows the most intense creative community connections between pairs of these TTWAs, while the right-hand one normalises this measure by the size of the participating communities. The figures point to examples of strong connections between some clusters, including Bristol, Bath and Cardiff in the west, Edinburgh and Glasgow in Scotland, and cities like Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield and Liverpool in the north of England. The data further show that one in ten members of cre creative meetups in the UK are actually based outside of the UK. 41% of these are based in EU countries. For reasons which should be obvious, policymakers must pay attention to the importance of these connections in the coming years. Now, it should be apparent that we've come a long way in characterising creative clusters from the simple business population heat maps that we and others relied on to identify clusters just a few years ago. The expanding universe of potential data sets permits more granular and more timely characterisation of the systems within which creative businesses operate, and notwithstanding the obvious challenges in using data that was not created for the purpose of analysis, our experience is that there is much to be gained in mining them. A consequence of the much richer set, richer set of insights that can be gleaned from the data is that there is a wider set of constituencies and potential users who can derive value from it. And for that reason, wherever possible, we make publicly available the data sets we use. We found that data visualisation tools such as interactive maps are a powerful and popular way of allowing users to understand the data and maximise the insights they get from research. And in projects like our GamesMap.UK with Games Trade Body Yuki, which is targeting industry users, and our on ongoing Arlesiador project that Ian mentioned earlier with innovation policies in the Welsh Government, we're exploring this value proposition further. So, trying to bring all of this together. My contention is that the story of measurement of the creative economy, initiated by John Newbigin, who we'll hear from later, and others almost 20 years ago, has been one of the search for legitimation. In the UK, at least, some progress has been made on that score, and it must surely be the case that the success of campaigns such as those to extend tax reliefs to various subsectors of the creative industries in recent years, or to the overhaul, or the overhaul of teaching of ICT in English schools, cannot wholly be separated from the turn towards stronger metrics in the creative industries. However, the op opportunity now is to, to give data a much more active role in local creative economy development, to move beyond legitimation. And I hope some of the research that I've outlined here points to ways this might be done. Here I just briefly end by listing a few areas where our work shows there are immediate opportunities for policymakers, agencies and other bodies, uh, other bodies like universities who have a brief to develop their creative economies like local labour market strategy, where we've shown that data scraped from online job ads can be used to paint a detailed, real-time picture of local employer skills needs, which can be compared with the education profile of local universities that I presented today. Or knowledge exchange, where disconnects between topics being discussed at meetups and areas of local industrial strength may help tell universities where they can help fill the gap with knowledge exchange activities. We can look at the relationship between cultural activity, something I've not had time to talk about today, cultural activity and the creative economy, 
where we can use the location of cultural venues based on listings data to see whether there is any correlation between cultural vibrancy and the performance of creative industries. Or finally, and this is the subject of one of our work streams in the Arlesiador project that I mentioned, we can try and actually predict what the industrial makeup of places means for the nature of related industries that may come in time to develop in the future in an area, thereby informing development priorities. So I'll leave it there, and uh, if there's any time for questions, I can try and pick them up later. Thank you.